I've done my best to teach them. how not to do it. (coughs) Last week, I was um, (laughs) supposed to have a clip. I thought about it after church, about the time I was walking across the street. So I'm going to play it this week. has nothing to do with my message this week. It's all about last week's, but I liked it, and a couple of the guys went to some pain to get it all together, so um, I I asked Greta this morning, I said, do you still have it? And she said, well, what was the name of it? And I said, well, duh, the do. (laughs) Oh, yeah. So I want you to watch it. I hope you enjoy it, because if not, I'm going to be stoned. (laughs) What's up? Forgot my due. There's some things you just can't live without. <laughs> Those of you who are Mountain Dew fanatics, you, you understand that. Has nothing to do with this week's, but reflect back. <laughs> Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Psalms. For a long time, I thought this was Palms. We have a book of trees. Psalms 130, verses 1 and 2. Out of the depths, David writes, I cry to you, O Lord. David cried out to God from the very depth of his soul. In a moment of despair, in a moment of need, from the depths I cried, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. I don't know if you've ever been desperate at that point, that moment of desperation. If you have, let me assure you that God has given you the best tool that could ever be imagined for you to climb out of that deep, deep hole. If you've just wanted to be friends, to be close to God, and you just wanted to worship him. God has given you the very best tool that you'll ever imagine to be able to express, to be able to lay it out before him. If you've ever been in a battle, Satan's coming against you, against your family, against your loved ones. 
God has given you the greatest weapon that you could ever imagine to overcome the enemy and to gain victory. And it's called prayer. The depths, we've all been there. We'll go there again. But there's a depth in your heart, in your spirit, man, that some of us never plumb. We never get to that depth. Where from there we cry out to God. David's burden was so great that in this moment it seemed like there was nothing in the universe that could equal it. He wanted, he needed to get to God, get God's attention. You and I have a right. A right that's written in the word to come before God in that way. We can come boldly, we can come humbly, crying out to God. He will give attention. Every time we cry, He hears. Elijah bowed before God on the Mount of Carmel, face down, cried out to God. Suddenly fire fell from heaven, consuming sacrifice, consuming altar, consuming all the, the water. And even the dust that was on that sacrifice. We have to remember that the blessing followed the fire. It still does. When the fire falls, the blessing is not very far behind. Because the fire is a cleansing tool, but it only comes by prayer. The heavens were open and the rains came. Seven times it took. Praying, seeking God from the depths of his being. Seven times. Six times the servant came back and said, there's nothing happening. Didn't phase the prophet, did it? He said, go look again. And he began to cry out, call upon God. God unlocked the clouds, loosed the rain. It fell upon the land, and the land was blessed. The people were blessed. One person can unlock heaven. You might be that person. Mary, Queen of Scots. If you know anything about history, you have read about old Mary. She gave the highest compliment probably that's ever been given to anyone by a monarch. She said that she was more afraid of the prayers of John Knox than of an army of 10,000 men. She sent for him one day, and she began to unfold the plan that she had plotted. And she told him her plans. He rose and said, your plans will come to naught. Indignantly, she said, how do you know? I am queen. He said, I will stop you 
at the throne of grace. He prayed that God would bring to naught the plans of Mary, Queen of Scots. And it was thwarted. God moved at the prayers of one man. Wouldn't it be absolutely great if Washington had reason to be afraid of God's people in that same way? It is possible for us to touch heaven through prayer, and we should, so that those that plot evil will quake. We can preach. We can stand behind pulpits made of wood, metal, or plastic. We can plan, I mean, the grandest plans that you've ever seen. We can pray those high ceiling few people type prayers until we're blue in the face. But the only thing that's going to move heaven is a man or a woman who can call upon God and get his attention and they'll pray until he moves. Without that, there'll be no power. There'll be no revival. There'll be no grand move of God. A revival of prayer will bring a revival of spirit. They're tied together. People who will not pray will not see a mighty move of God. People who will not fall on their faces and their knees before him calling upon his name will never see his hand move in might and power in their midst. It's prayer that brings value. It's prayer that brings value. Years ago in California, there was a huge trial that took place. The object of the trial was a will. One person said the will said this, and another person said the will said that. And then there was another that said, no, that will says something else. They knew where the will was. It was locked in a safe that nobody knew the combination to. <clears throat> so a manhunt ensued for somebody that could open the safe. The judge sent out a call over all of California. And in all of California, nobody could come up with the combination and open the safe. They could not find anybody on the West Coast who could open that safe. But finally, they found a man in Chicago. Chicken in the car and the car won't go. Chicken jumped out and broke his toes. Chicago. <laughs> That's the way you spell Chicago. My, my granny taught me how to spell Chicago. Chicken in the car and the car won't go. The chicken jumped out and broke his toes. Chicago. Anyway. <laughs> Just thought I'd throw that out in case you were wanting to know how to spell Chicago. They found a guy. In, you never know, do you? Just never know. Susan says, what are you doing? They found a, a guy in Chicago, and he told them, I'll have it open in five minutes. And they laughed at him. But the judge didn't laugh. He said, send for that guy. They sent a special rail car. 
They cleared the track. Because this, this, this trial that was going on was so tedious and so important. Millions of millions were at stake. They sent a special rail car to pick him up. They cleared the line. He had a straight shot all the way through to Sacramento. He arrived, and in five minutes, that door swung open. The safe was open. The papers were there. The judge turned around and looked at him and said, Sir, you are more valuable to us than a million people because you did something they could not do. Listen, I tell that story for this reason. The man or the woman who is able to open the windows of heaven, that man or woman who knows the combination, that, that knows how to open those windows of heaven and bring the blessings down is the most important person in this church. That man or woman that can touch the throne and see the fire fall, see the power of God fall, they're the most important person in this church. You and I, need to be surrounded today in the kingdom of God by people who are able to touch by the Spirit the very throne room of God, open the windows and the storehouses of God and bring down the blessing upon all of us so that we can see His power, His might, His Holy Spirit move among us that the sick might be healed, that the lame might be delivered, that the unsaved might come to know him. The great Welch revival that swept across the country of Wales and Scotland and Ireland was started by the prayers of one man. It was a re revival that was born in prayer. G. Campbell Morgan one of the greatest Bible teachers and expositors that possibly has ever lived. Still today, we, we buy his books and read his words. He went to Wales. They had summoned him, asked if he would please come expediently. So he heads to Wales from England. And he goes expecting to be able to preach. As he was at the meeting that night, hundreds and hundreds of people had gathered. He was all prepared to bring a tremendous sermon. And finally, somebody said, uh, no, sir, we don't want you to preach. We want you to pray. He said for a, a split second, his heart dropped, but then it began to soar. When he realized what they were asking of him, he was to reach the throne. He was to touch God so powerfully. He stepped to the pulpit opened wide his arms and began to call on God. It's, it literally just began to flow in that house. What, what was going on? How did that revival really get started? There was one man prayed for three years. God, drench my land in your presence. Change the direction 
of our leadership. God, let the power of your presence be felt. God answered that prayer. Three years he prayed constantly. That person who can mount up on wings of faith calling those things that are not as though they were. Reach the throne of God. Get God's attention. He will have his prayer answered. I've seen men and women in days gone by literally pray all night long. They'd come together for prayer, 7 o'clock. Sun would still be up during the summer. And they would pray until the sun came up the next morning. And literally it seemed like one hour is all that had passed. I've gathered together with some. My home church in Lake Placid, Florida. And I've heard those saints calling upon God with such power that literally you could hear the windows Shake. The power of God would come into that room. God would sweep across that place. You could feel it. There would be a breeze. When we were in our first church, we had some of those kind of prayers. And they would call upon God and literally... I've seen God walk into a, a, a service very similar to this and start at the back and row by row by row, people would just start weeping and fall on their knees until you could literally see it as it swept to the pulpit and the choir. That man or a woman who will rise on those wings of faith, touch God. They're the most valuable person. Romans 8, 26 says, in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings that are too deep for words. Phil McLean, awesome, tremendous man of God. Director of Teen Challenge. Never smoked a cigarette. Never tasted a drop of alcohol had only dated one girl in his life, and he married her and had six kids with her. Gave birth to Teen Challenge in the living room of his house. He would go out and bring in prostitutes, drug addicts, get people out of jail, and they'd come and live in his living room. That's where Teen Challenge for Michigan was born. We were in a school building. It was huge. An old elementary school. It was our men's unit. Five miles away or so, three miles away was the women's unit. All of that came birthed in prayer. I remember one day I said, Brother McLean, we don't have any money. We've got all these mouths to feed. There's 40 men. and We don't have any food. I said, okay. Gather the students together. Let's go in the auditorium. Let's pray. All the students gathered around 
the front of that little platform. Brother McLean got right up toward the back of the platform and just laid down. When he started groaning before God, the hair stood up on my arms. I heard something in the spirit world. Satan had to step back. Everything that was holding the blessings from flowing stepped back. I sensed it. I knew it. I was in awe of what was taking place in that little auditorium. There was groanings. No words. Just groaning. Suddenly, from the very depths of his soul, he said, oh, oh. I knew that he was giving birth to something. The doors opened. They had a squeak. And I looked. Nobody was there. I said, come on in, Lord. <laughs> By that time, a bald head come looking around. So I got up and went back there, and he says, uh, can y'all use some food? I said, are you kidding? <laughs> yeah, we need some. He said, well, I got a little bit out here. And I went out and had a a pickup truck with sides on it. And he had Hubbard squash to the top of it. Now, if you're from up north, you know what a Hubbard squash is. If you're from down south, you have no clue. It's almost like a pumpkin or a butternut squash. Oh, no, not a butternut, uh, an acorn squash, except they're about this big around. I don't know. He had 150 of them. We had squash down the hallways. We had squash under the beds. We had squash in the showers. We had squash everywhere. It is absolutely delicious. It's as sweet as a butternut squash. But I said, okay, let me get some guys. And I went in and tapped two of them, and I said, come on, we, we got to unload a truck. So we went out, and we got it unloaded and hugged him, and he was driving off, and another fella pulled in. He says, um, y'all need some food? <laughs> and I said, yeah, what you got? <laughs> he said, I got some pole beans, I got some corn, and I got some squash. And I said, Hubbard squash. He said, no, this is yellow squash. And, and, and what was the other green one thing? Zucchini. So we unloaded him. Yeah. Oh, hey, this, this story's got a ways to go. You, you want to climb Jacob's ladder? Son, it's time. We hugged him. He left. I went back inside. By the time I knelt down, I looked. A head come around the corner. I got up and went back there. And he says, um, I, I work with the government. And I said, oh, why do you want to mess everything up? <laughs> he said, I'm with the Department of Agriculture and weights and measurements. And I thought, oh, this, okay. He said, um, we go around ever so often to the stores and we weigh the packages and it has to weigh exactly what the package says it weighs or we take it off the shelf. And um, can you use some food? I <laughs> said, I reckon we can. What you got? And he said, I've got sugar. He said, um, 
I've got uh, uh, black beans. I guess about 20 cases of them. Garbanzo beans. Flour. Shortening. And he just kept naming. And he got all the way down to the end. And he says, and I've got about 100 cartons of cigarettes. And um, I, I, I don't know how many, I don't remember how many cases of uh, beer and wine. And I said, we can take everything but those last two things. We, we can't take those. And he said, no, you have to take everything or you don't get any of it. I'll be right back. So I took the papers and I ran in. And Brother McLean, I, I tapped him on the shoulder and I said, there's a guy out here from the government and this is what he's got. And there was a list. And I said, I told him we could take everything but these last two. And he said, we take everything or we don't take any of it. He said, then we don't take any of it. He said, all of these kids, they're being set free from those things. We're not going to touch them. So I went back out, handed him back his papers, and I said, I'm sorry. We can't take it. He said, but I thought you, you needed it. I said, we need it desperately, sir. Can't take it. We have standards. And he said, well, y'all are weird. I said, no, we're godly. He got in his truck. Drove off. I went back inside. I knelt down. About 20, 30 minutes later, I looked. That same head come around the corner. Come here. So I went back there. And he said, you know, I was driving down Pontaluna Avenue, and I, I, I saw the, uh, um, I think it was an Elks Club, something like that. And he said, there were some cars there, so I stopped. They're a civic organization, so I said, can y'all help me out? Teen Challenge down here, they can take everything but the beer, the wine, and the cigarettes. Y'all wouldn't want some beer, wine, and cigarettes, would you? They said, yeah, we don't want none of that other stuff, but give us that. <coughs> said, well, you're going to have to sign for it. They said, we'll sign for everything. Take all the groceries back down there. Leave the cigarettes and the wine and the beer here. So he came down and he says, your signature don't even have to be on the paper. But uh, we got 300 pounds of sugar. Where do you want me to put it? We started unloading that semi-truck. Our kitchen, our pantry was overflowing. He left. I came back in. And I knelt down. And I said, God, you're just absolutely awesome. Brother McLean let out a. door opened one more time and I looked and the mailman so I got up and I went and he says registered letter you need to sign for it I signed he handed me two pieces of mail he said this is all y'all had today and I said, God, you're really cutting it short. <laughs> Two letters. We, we need a minimum of $10,000. Took $10,000 a week to operate that place. Free will offerings. I carried him in. I said, Brother McLean, two letters is all that came. He said, let me see them. He opened it up. The first one was for $10,000. 
it was from Mr. Turkey. <laughs> Mr. Turkey is really Mr. Turkey. One of the biggest turkey producers in the United States. His son got saved, delivered from drugs, and filled with the Holy Spirit on a Friday night on the beach in Muskegon, Michigan. And that man, he watched out after Teen Challenge after that. Brother McLean opened the second letter. $15,000 check. He said, well, we're good for a week. He touched heaven. I know where that came from. It came from those prayers. God literally moved mountains. He did what nobody else could do. We didn't have a prayer without God moving. There's groanings that come that touch the throne of grace. The king of Greece called the, the portrait painter in. And he said to him, I want, I want you to do something special. And the painter said, anything you want, sir. He said, I want you to paint, and I'll give you $10,000 if you'll paint for me a groan on canvas. The artist stepped back and bowed his head and he said, Oh, king, no man has ever been able to paint a groan on canvas because a groan belongs to the secret recesses of a heart. I'm here to tell you this morning that God has painted it. God has given it a voice. And God has given it power. You and I sit here, we don't think too much of it. Even sometimes when we hear it, it's a little annoying. We don't really think of what it is. But the Holy Ghost knows how to pray in groanings. And he says things that you and I can't comprehend. Jude chapter 1 verse 20, and I'm closing. Dear friends, build yourselves up in the most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. Last week at the end of the service, I said if you want that infilling of the Holy Spirit, if you want the dew of heaven to fall upon you, come. And, and I was shocked because the front of this auditorium filled. Now I'm saying this week that that dew that fell last week, you and I need to start putting it into action and begin to pray in the Holy Ghost and allow the Holy Spirit to pray through us that we might reach up and touch the throne of grace for one another, for this church, for this community, for, for our nation. Because unless the Holy Spirit sweeps across this nation and touches hearts of men and women, the, uh, the, the United States of America will cease to be. It's already changed drastically. But I'm telling you, the world that you and I grew up in has changed. Somebody has to step in the gap. Somebody has to get a hold of God. Somebody has to ask for mercy and a reprieve. Because our sons and daughters are at stake.
I'll take up at that place next week. Bow your heads with me, would you please? Father, in the